Is everybody awake now? <laughs> Good, morning. Good morning. My name is Connie Purcell, and it is my privilege to serve this morning as your worship associate. Our theme for the month of June is power. Power is many things. It is the ability to control people in their sayings and our actions. It is the ability to get whatever you want or in some cases take whatever you want. It can be harnessed from within one's own self for self-improvement and growth. It can be shared for teaching and mentoring, in leadership and in delegation. It can be abused by leaders of nations and dictators, causing them to rise to great heights and then fall in disgrace. We've seen some of this with some politicians and celebrities over the past years. And then there's the spreading and multiplication of power, the sort of phenomenon that occurs when people come together after earthquakes or floods or other natural disasters, such as occurred um, after 9-11 or the bombings at the Boston Marathon. We are horrified by the disaster itself but awed and heartened by the response of ordinary people who spontaneously show and share their best selves. Just when you think humanity is going to the dogs, we see ordinary individuals step forward and tend to the wounded, the broken, the traumatized, the homeless, and the abused. Neighbors help neighbors or people they don't even know people are reminded that they are not alone and that they have a place in the broader community, that someone sees them and that their pain matters to others. In fact, we see that here at Tapestry in some of our social outreach. There doesn't have to be a disaster for good people to come together. Reverend Kent will be speaking shortly about the power of community and the sort of shared power that can transform individuals in a community, a community such as Tapestry. I'm looking forward to hearing his words because this community is important to me and because it is important that we come together to accomplish tasks, to demonstrate that we live our principles, that we gather round in times of celebration and sorrow, and that we give from deep within when a significant task is before us, like raising the roof for a capital campaign. Consider this quote from Mother Teresa. I can do things you cannot. You can do things I cannot. Together, we can do great things. Some of us are bringing our best selves to this space, and some of us are bringing our struggling selves. So whatever your situation, we are glad that you are here. All are welcome and all are loved. Together we affirm that this day and our being together can make each of us stronger, more considerate, and wiser than when we woke up this morning. We welcome you here to this good place, Tapestry, a Unitarian Universalist congregation. Uh, I have a couple of brief announcements. First of all, uh, today is the day of our annual meeting as required by our bylaws. And uh, it's of particular interest because we will be announcing the results of the capital campaign. And uh, as you partake of some of the refreshments, you can pick up an agenda back at the greeters table, the agenda for the meeting. And uh, while only members can vote, Everyone is welcome to observe if you're interested so you can see our democratic process at work. We also have new directories available. Um, they're back there by the first aid station, um, that back table on the wall where the coffee pot is, back where Richard Jagelko is waving. Um, so you could pick up a new directory after the service as well. 
We have a number of exciting events coming up at Tapestry, and some of them you saw on the PowerPoint. You can find information about these and other upcoming events on our Tapestry website. For those of you who just came in, we have lots of seats up in the front and on the site. So don't be bashful. So you can find uh, more information about the upcoming events on our website, on the Tapestry app, or uh, as I mentioned on the PowerPoint slides. We are a busy congregation with lots of activities. Our various groups and events reflect our vision of being a transformational home for liberal spirituality and a dynamic community leader in Orange County and beyond. And now, if I might, could I ask Glenn Paschal to light our flaming chalice, the central symbol of our Unitarian Universalist heritage. We light our chalice this morning, grateful for the love we experience in this beloved community. May the flame light the way for all who seek such abundance and human connection. Come burdened, come savvy, come discouraged, come wanting, come full, come longing, come drifting. Come into this community and this time to worship together. Welcome to our home. Welcome to Tapestry. <laughs> Every Sunday as we gather for worship, we lift up the joys and sorrows in our midst. Um, some do that by lighting a candle in silent re recognition of those milestones, and others either email or write a um, thought or prayer. This morning, I briefly want to say, because I'm kind of out of words, that our thoughts and prayers go out to the victims in Orlando. I also want to lift up their families and members of the LGBT community and just mention that a lot of hearts are broken today. If that's, I'm realizing that that may be news for some of you. Um, either ask your neighbor about it in a pause during the worship or check out any news source. Um, Richard Jajelko also shares that his cousin, Lee Petrie Springer, died this week in Urbana, Illinois. Lee was a gentle and kind student of Buddhism, an activist for racial and gender equality and in opposition to war. Please keep Lee's sister, Claudia and Lynn, along with Lee's husband and children in your thoughts. Would you join me in reading our congregational response? For your joys, we join you in celebration. For your sorrows and concerns, may you feel our compassion. For all that is spoken and unspoken, May the caring of our beloved community sustain you. Um, and now we have a somewhat rare ceremony. We're welcoming new members into our community. Um, we'll do this before our time for all ages because we have Kathy with us, Kathy the Dragon Girl. Um, that's what Barbara calls her because her name tag is a dragon. So Carl Webb, Peggy Thompson, Jenny and Scott Ellsworth, Shelley Blair and Sam Hooker, would you come up and join me, please? And I was thinking we could stand up here, but I don't think there's quite enough room, so hang out right there. <laughs> you have chosen to become members of Tapestry, and some of you, some of these faces have been around for quite a while. Um, they're just now making it official, I guess we would say. You've each chosen to become members of Tapestry, and I'm glad that this feels like a place that you can call home. We look forward to learning from you and with you and to helping you on your faith journey. We'll be here to celebrate life's greatest joys 
and to accompany you through its sometimes painful complexities. You've been here a while and made some connections. Over time, those connections will multiply and they will deepen. But so that we can all know a little bit about you today, uh, Linda's going to introduce each of you briefly to the congregation. Let's start with Carl Webb. Carl is from Vista, California, and has lived in Lake Forest for 20 years. He's a programmer for a financial firm in Irvine. He came to Tapestry when his friend, Jenny Ellsworth, told him how great Tapestry is. He says he stayed because to his delight, it is true. <laughs> he likes to go on nature walks, participate in role-playing games, and write last-minute autobiographical statements on his phone. <laughs> Next is Jenny Ellsworth, who gave us such a glowing recommendation to Carl. She's from Costa Mesa, where she grew up attending OCUUC, OCUUC. Then she went off to college and had other interests. She returned to UU at the Laguna Beach Fellowship, drawn by an announcement for a talk called, How Not to Demonize Your Enemies, and realized that was exactly what she needed. Glenn Pascal gave that talk. She stayed at Laguna Beach until she found that Tapestry was much closer because she lives in Lake Forest. Jenny is a stay-at-home mom, volunteering a lot at her daughter Kathy's school in the library, running the science fair. She says she keeps coming for the people, the ideas, and because she finds it easier to see other people's worth when she's around you use. <laughs> Jenny is a cat person. She has a really beautiful cat named Avatar. She loves reading science fiction and fantasy and participating in role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons. And besides, she likes to roast coffee. <laughs> Scott Ellsworth works for Google on analytics, and he has worked in biotech and econometrics before that. He says that the details differ, but his jobs have always been turning a complicated abstraction into an elegant and useful system. He's been an unintentional Californian since his college days brought him out here. And 25 years later, he's still here. He says his path to tapestry was a winding one. When he was in junior high school, he patched together a faith from humanism, paganism, and new age spirituality, which worked for him until his response to the issue of reverence on his Eagle Scout application convinced his parents to get the boy to church. <laughs> it was then that he finally discovered himself to be an old Catholic who holds that faith, uh, who holds that faith which has been believed everywhere always by all. And that's why tapestry, which supports many faiths and many tradition, appeals to him. Now, because she loves to come to Tapestry, I'd like to introduce Kathy, the Ellsworth's daughter. She says she started to attend the Laguna Beach Fellowship because she wondered where her mom disappeared to on Sunday mornings. <laughs> and then she came along here to Tapestry when her mom found us. She says attending Tapestry has really helped her deal with some of the kids at school who are members of other religious faiths and want to disprove science. Kathy loves cats and dragons and she's almost 12. <laughs> Peggy Thompson grew up in Fair Oaks, a suburb of Sacramento. Her parents were intellectuals and seekers who discovered UUism when Peggy was just a child. So she has been a lifelong UU. When she first moved to Irvine in 1977, she looked for a UU congregation but didn't find one. Through the years, she would drop into the UU congregation in Costa Mesa, but never felt a connection. Eventually, friends at Irvine Unified Church of Christ invited her to join FOCD, but she couldn't because she was 24-7 caretaker for her mother. After her mother passed away, she decided to join FOCD and start visiting. One day, she met Kent at music, liked him, Love that he walked the walk and didn't just talk the talk. Then she ran into him at a candlelight vigil, had a great conversation, and on that basis decided to give Tapestry a try. She felt immediately welcomed and she has been here ever since. 
so it's not surprising that when I asked her about her interest, she said, F-O-C-D, <laughs> three times. <laughs> she has gone from visiting a half hour a week to making a full-time calling. She is also active in Amnesty International and the Democratic Party. After working for Xerox for 31 years as the Western Regional Manager of Real Estate Planning and Strategy, managing real estate acquisitions, leaps and negotiations, design, construction, and building maintenance, she fit right into working on a new facility for tapestry. <laughs> Peggy lives with her four-legged companions, Lucy and Peanut, and Violetta, a young Honduran asylum seeker she took in last November. Shelley Blair, a South Orange County girl, met her husband, Sam Hooker, at Texas A&M when she went there to get a PhD. They most recently lived in Madrid for two years and then moved back to Orange County to be close to family and to settle down. They have been looking for a congregation that would fit their interfaith marriage. Sam is agnostic and Shelley is a progressive Christian and they are delighted to have found tapestry. Sam is already volunteering with FOCD and they both love the musical table event. Sam works as senior web developer for First American Corporation in Santa Ana and Shelley works in organizational development at Toastmasters International World Headquarters in Rancho Santa Margarita. They are both dog and cat lovers with an adorable dog named Cervantes and a feisty cat named Maxwell. They love hosting parties, which is good news for the stuck in the middle with you use group. <laughs> and Shelley is running for Mission Viejo, Viejo City Council member in November. Unitarian Universalist congregations are covenanted communities. By joining tapestry, you enter into a covenant with this congregation. It's not a creedal test of membership. There's no test of belief. But we do ask that you participate with an open heart and an open mind. We ask that you share your resources of time and money. And we ask that when things are less than perfect, that you will work with us to make them better before walking away. Is that a covenant that you can agree with as we struggle to build a beloved community here together? Yes. Great. There's one final step to joining, and that's to sign our membership book. There it is. Barbara will help you with signing the book. She also has a chalice lapel pen for each of you. As you know, the chalice is the central symbol of our tradition. So may this pen symbolize for you the warmth and the work and the joy and the struggle of building a community together. Wear it with pride or keep it somewhere safe, but let it remind you of the choice you've made to be with these great people. Welcome to Tapestry. Some of you have probably read it before. Um, and I just realized that before I read you this story, I should probably mention, your parents may have said this, but I'm going to be gone for about three months to go on a little bit of a break. Um, you may remember Caitlin was away for a break recently. I'm, I'm not coming back with a baby. <laughs> I, am, I am just coming back with myself, but it will be a nice break, and I look forward to seeing you guys in September. So for now, I have a story. It's called Swimmy. A happy school of little fish lived in a corner of the sea somewhere. They were all red. Only one of them was as black as a mussel shell. He swam faster than his brothers and sisters, and his name was Swimmy. Hi, Althea. One day, a tuna fish, swift, fierce, and very hungry, came darting through the waves. In one gulp, he swallowed all the little red fish. Only Swimmy escaped. He swam away in the deep, wet world. He was scared, lonely, and very sad. But the sea was full of wonderful creatures, and as he swam from marvel to marvel, Swimmy was happy again. He saw a medusa made of rainbow jelly. A lobster who walked about like a water moving machine. 
strange fish pulled by an invisible thread. And a forest of seaweed growing from sugar candy rocks. An eel whose tail was too far away to remember. <laughs> and sea anemones who looked like pink palm trees swaying in the wind. Then, hidden in the dark shade of rocks and weeds, he saw a school of little fish just like his own. Let's go and swim and play and see things, he said happily. We can't, said the little red fish. The big fish will eat us all. But you can't just lie there, said Swimmy. We must think of something. Swimmy thought and thought and thought. And suddenly he said, I have it. We're going to swim all together like the biggest fish in the sea. And he taught them to swim close together, each in his own place. And when they had learned to swim like one giant fish, he said, I'll be the eye. And they swam into the cool morning water and the midday sun and chased the big fish away. And that is the end of our story. I hope you guys enjoy your class, and we'll see you in a little bit. Have fun. Today will be a very full day with meetings and music and readings and new members. But let us take just a moment to sit together in quiet stillness. Sit back, relax, take a couple of deep breaths and let the wisdom of this community stillness embrace you. Namaste. Amen and blessed be. So you know that we're wrapping up our capital campaign today. The most recent development in our effort to find a permanent home was meeting with a design and construction team. And the architect asked us about our mission and the way that the building should make room for our ministry. Now up to that point, we had been so used to fitting our lives into the shape of this little box here that we hadn't thought much about how we would design a building around our particular needs. It's a big question. Some congregations have very particular ministries. Some hu feed huge numbers of homeless people. Orange Coast Unitarian has AIDS team ministry. It's like a meals on wheels for people living with AIDS. So they need a lot of food storage and food preparation space. Some congregations have zero children. Some have more than they can count and they're bursting with seams, bursting at the seams. And some have particular furniture for their worship. Imagine having a small pool for baptisms up here at the front. It gets very different depending on the church. It's a big question. How do you want our architecture to support what we do? Since I'm going away on sabbatical, I had to think about these things pretty darn fast. What I realized was that more than any particular thing that we do, the key piece of our life is how we are together. We thrive by breaking bread together and forging real cross-generational relationships. We explore new and challenging ideas together. We fight for justice and care for the most marginalized people in Orange County together. We sing and play and eat and laugh and sometimes cry together. 
And so I told our designer that our sanctuary, where we worship, should be more like a meeting house than a theater. We should be able to see one another's faces, not sit isolated in the darkness watching what happens on a stage. I told the architect that our space should be multi-generational. It should be easy enough for our senior members to navigate, and it should have areas large enough for our energetic children to express their full, physically active selves. And those spaces shouldn't be at opposite ends of the building. They should be together. The magic of our community comes not from our brilliant thoughts or our piety. It's not how organized we are. For lack of a better word, it's actually about how chaotic we are. It's about spontaneous conversations and games and hugs and baking tips and political insights, all that pop up as we mix and mingle. How many of you were here last Sunday for Youth Sunday? It was a good number, okay. Every year our high school seniors deliver a powerful message. This year, each one of them included in their message a part of how tapestry had nurtured their development. They spoke of a commitment that encouraged them to grow as individuals and about having opportunities to participate that fit their own personality, outspoken or quiet as they may be. Freedom to explore and to ask hard questions was important to them. And they learned at Tapestry that uncertainty isn't a failure. In fact, knowing how little you know is a sign of maturity. These wise 17 and 18 year olds spoke of a community that allowed enough opportunities to bump around in life, to make mistakes and learn from them, and to always know that they would be accepted here. Probably better than I will accomplish today, last week our youth described growing up in a congregation where we know that we are better together. This morning's children's story was also about finding strength and community. Swimmy is a favorite with some of our families. It's pretty clear why. In case you missed it, Swimmy is the fish who was afraid of the bigger fish, so he organized all his little buddies to swim in the shape of one giant fish. In their community effort, they were able to scare away the big fish that might otherwise eat them up for lunch. In this tale, Swimmy learned that when you pull together as a group, you can protect yourself from the bullies of the world. We're stronger together. Even the little fish that would otherwise be swallowed up can protect themselves. Obviously, we are meant to identify with Swimmy in this story. Who then are the big fish that threaten us? Who or what are the big fish that lurk in the depths? Who or what makes us hide instead of swimming free. I'm sure each one of us can name a few big fish, a bully, an organization, maybe even a church that's made us feel unsafe. A good children's story, I've learned, has a fun, relatable story for the kids, and it connects with a lesson. A great children's story, though, offers a lesson that opens all of our minds to several different layers of meaning. We know that the story of Swimmy is a metaphor. It's not just about fish. It's about us being stronger in community. I think there's more to this story than protecting ourselves from bullies, though. Too often, we think the big fish is a political party or a corporation, an individual or a government. 
What if the real big fish isn't a person or an organization? What if the real big fish, the one that endangers our world, is fear and hatred, greed, jealousy? What if the real big fish is the illusion that we are somehow better or different from other people? Back in April, I attended our district assembly in Santa Barbara. The keynote speaker there was the Reverend Rosemary Bray McNatt. She's an African-American Unitarian Universalist minister. She's known for having a very clear voice about anti-racist ministry. I've actually quoted her in previous sermons. She's pretty amazing. In her keynote speech, she told us the story about the underlying sentiment of her faith. Like many of us, Rosemary grew up not as a Unitarian, but as a Catholic. She fondly remembers the ritual of her community, and she remembers the songs that they sang at camp. There's one song that you probably are familiar with that stuck in her heart. It's the song, They Will Know We Are Christians By Our Love. I was kind of familiar with it, but not really, so I had to look up the lyrics. The two verses include these words. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, and we pray that our unity will one day be restored. They'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. And then the second verse says, we will work with each other, we will work side by side, we'll guard each other's dignity and save each other's pride, and they'll know we are Christians by our love. Rosemary told us that when she found Unitarian Universalism and her faith as an adult was renewed, this song from her past came back to her. When she became a Unitarian, this is how she wanted to live her faith. This is how she wanted others to know about Unitarian Universalism, by her love. I tell this story because Rosemary is known for creating justice and doing hard work and having hard conversations. Her whole message at District Assembly was about us creating change in the world and the fact that we UUs need to move beyond our compulsion to be nice and move beyond our compulsion to be comfortable. To con confront racism and greed, we need to be willing to disrupt business as usual. We need to speak out and put our bodies on the line if necessary. That's what she said. Her commitment to justice, though, is one based on a vision of beloved community, like Gandhi or Dr. King. Rosemary is committed to confronting evil in the world with love. It's very easy to get distracted by bullies and think that they are the source of all problems. The real big fish, though, are more pernicious than bullies. They're bigger than individuals or political organizations. They're hatred, fear, jealousy, and the illusion that we are somehow better or different from other people. In June, when our annual meeting comes up every year, I feel this need to acknowledge our commitment to democratic process. After the worship, today we'll have our annual meeting and this congregation will elect new leaders and you'll approve an annual budget. Our congregations vote to choose their minister, to govern themselves. Our denomination is structured almost in a mirror to our national democratic process. It's even explicitly named in the seven principles. In our UU tradition, we covenant with one another to promote the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process. 
But just as a children's story should have multiple layers, so can democracy. At its most basic level, democracy is a literal interpretation. Individual members of a community vote to make a decision. Each person gets a vote. Every vote is equal. Each vote counts. Not so complicated, right? If you scratch beneath the surface, another level of democracy is revealed. And we find that the mechanism of voting is a tool for communities to govern themselves. It's a mechanism to clarify the will of a gathering of people. It's the fruit of conversation and personal discernment. As a congregation, we do that pretty well, actually. We talk with one another respectfully and consider a variety of points of view. We thoughtfully consider alternatives. And once we've had a good conversation, we take a vote to clarify that, yes, that's what we think. What do you think it would look like if we carried that commitment with us when we left this building? What would it look like if we remembered the inherent worth and dignity, not just of our tapestry friends at the annual meeting, but also our fellow Americans as we discern what's right for our country? Tuesday night, a few of us gathered to watch the California returns for the primary race. And during that news coverage, one of the reporters pointed out how vitriolic political disagreements had become. Until this presidential election, it was customary for the nominee of one party to very publicly congratulate the nominee of the other party. It was standard decorum for a presidential election. Yet this year, it's almost unimaginable to think of Secretary Clinton congratulating Donald Trump for becoming the nominee of the Republican Party. Or the opposite. National political debate has reached such a fevered pitch that there is no room for acknowledging even the slightest positive trait of a rival. We've got to do better. Supporting democracy demands more of us, and our faith demands more of us than mobilizing our side to win. It's not enough to stand for justice if in the process we sling hatred at our adversaries. I'm not asking anyone to compromise your beliefs. There are some things that are evil in this world. They should be rooted out and destroyed. Racism, sexism, homophobia are evil. Exploitation of the poor and of our earth are evil. Fear of people who are different from us is evil. And thinking that we are fundamentally better than our neighbors is evil. People, though, human beings like you and me are not. As confused as we may get from time to time, each one of us has the potential to love and to learn. I beg you to remember that the next time you open the newspaper or turn on the television. Beginning on Wednesday, I'll be away from tapestry for about three months for a sabbatical, and I'll be studying and doing some renewal. I've thought a lot about what I want to leave you with for this time, and it's a challenge for you and for me. In the coming months, our lives will be awash in political propaganda. Divisive rhetoric will paint human beings as monsters. 
for, for our own spiritual well-being and for the well-being of our country, we're called to a different way. We may disagree, but we will not dehumanize our adversaries. We may organize and struggle for what we believe in, but we will not sling hatred, even if it is heaped upon us. It's a very tall order, but it's ours. I can't think of anything more in keeping with the great faith tradition that we inherit than to stand on the side of love during a vitriolic political season. One of the most valuable things that we can offer our world is a collaborative spirit. Remember, our mission isn't to be right or to dole out reward and punishment or justice. Our mission is to build beloved community whenever and however we can. Amen. Would you take the hand of someone near you for these closing words? With faith to face our challenges, with love to cast out fear, with hope to trust tomorrow, we accept this day as the gift it is, a reason to rejoice. Now go in peace and let the light within you be a blessing to the world.